As I sit here typing out these stories, there is one that nags at me from the back of my mind. To add a bit of a literary flourish, I have erected a wall between that memory and the rest of my mind. I have tried to cordon it off, but as I recall my time in Nicaragua and all of those memories, I can hear it seething and scratching away at the walls. I know it has to be typed out or it won't leave me in peace. I am sorry in advance for this, a warning first. This story isn't something that's very terrifying. It is scarier in another aspect, I guess. It is also very personal to me, and even as I write this out, I still can't figure out why I'm doing it. All that being said and done, feel free to pass over this section as a bit of a superfluous outro. I had been in Nicaragua for about six months, and I have no shame in saying that I needed to take some time off. It is taxing work to try to understand and be understood in another culture. I told my host family that I would be leaving for the weekend. They were a little bit disappointed, but I am fairly certain they needed a vacation from me as well. I decided to go into Matagalpa, have a good meal, enjoy a couple of beers, and talk to some family and friends on Skype. I woke up early and journeyed into Esteli, and then caught a bus that would take me to Matagalpa in three hours. Before I continue, I would like to talk about the bus transportation system. Ask any Peace Corps volunteer in Nicaragua or elsewhere and they will have three or four horror stories ranging from buses breaking down in the middle of nowhere, overcrowding that makes you feel like you were packed in a gun like sardines, or being asked to pay exorbitant prices to be transported short distances to places that were nowhere near your end destination. The buses were old decommissioned school buses that had been repaired and put back into service. Most had metal racks welded onto the top and side so they could carry items. Imagine the cars from Mad Max, and that is a pretty accurate depiction of the transportation system. I was midway through the trip when a man got on with two 50-pound parcels of firewood. He was transporting them to sell in a nearby community for an inflated price. The cobra door tossed it on the roof, and it sounded like the roof would cave under the sudden weight. He hopped on the bus, and we continued towards Matagalpa. About 15 minutes later, he got off the bus, but either the driver had forgotten to offload the firewood or had decided to abscond with the three dollars worth of wood. The man realized what was happening as the bus began to drive off. He shouted, but the words didn't get through to the driver due to the ranchero music he was blasting on the radio. The man decided that if he couldn't get the bus to stop, he would just have to get his items himself. He ran up behind the bus and grabbed the metal rack and climbed up onto the roof of the moving bus. The driver was unaware of all of this and continued driving. The man managed to toss one bundle of wood when people began to realize that someone was on the roof. The bus was going about 40 or 50 miles per hour and I recognized the danger of the situation. I assumed falling off a bus going that fast would probably not end well. The driver had to stop or something terrible would happen. I waited through the other passengers who had already begun to talk excitedly and reached the driver. The man on the roof had reached the bundles of wood at this point. I shouted over the radio, stop. I told him to break because there was a man on the roof. I wish I never did that. The driver slammed the brakes and the bus grinded to a halt. 
the man at this point had managed to toss both parcels off onto the side of the road and was preparing to dismount from the back when the bus made its sudden stop. The quick stop pitched him forwards and off of the roof of the bus. The man swan dived and hit the road head first. Men swore, women screamed, I just looked on in shock. The man was on the road, twitched spasmodically like he had been tased. He spasmed and writhed for a few seconds before he stilled. The driver, Cobra Door, a few guys, and me hopped off the bus to check to see if he was all right. My major concern was that they might try to move him and paralyze him after his evident spinal injury. We reached him, and it became clear that my worrying about damaging his spinal cord was unneeded. He was already dead. I don't want to get into too much detail. I will only say that it wasn't like anything I'd seen on TV or movies. He was just there, sprawled out on the street. Little to no blood, he was just dead. We waited for the ambulance to come. They collected a statement before picking up the man and tossing him into the ambulance. I do not mean that as a literary flourish. One grabbed him by the legs and the other by the arms. Then they swung him and tossed him into the back of the ambulance like he was a sack of potatoes. That cemented it for me. The man was dead and it was my fault. I know how ridiculous that sounds. I've told myself how absurd it was many times. I know that I shouldn't think that way, I know I shouldn't blame myself. That doesn't change the thought, though. I made the driver stop, the sudden stop made the man fall. The fall killed the man, ergo I killed the man by shouting for the bus to stop. I tried convincing myself otherwise, but I can't. It's a thought that I bury, but it keeps unearthing itself. No matter how much I try to distract myself and bury it under mountains of other thoughts, it refuses to be forgotten. I think maybe that is why I am typing all of this. I told a few friends, but I never really got this in depth, never told them that last part. I've been trying to hide that thought for years now, but it resurfaces from time to time. I am done burying that memory. It is time to make it known and maybe find some form of catharsis in its revelation. That is what I am hoping for. This was hard for me, harder than I hope any of you will ever know. I think the hardest part of it will be when I actually upload it and I know that someone is going to read it. Maybe that's why I am posting this last part so late at night and doing any editing after the rest of the wiki is asleep. I'm casting it out into the Stygian depths of this wiki to be swallowed up in a sea of edits and contributions. The worst part of it is that when I think of them reading this, I feel such shame, guilt, and shame for my actions. When I think of you, who I now realize have become my friends over these past few years reading this. I feel only shame, it is a burden, and it feels like to 50-pound bundles of wood in my mind.